Okay, hello and thank you everyone for being here. Um, today we're going to talk about sensor camera sensor driver compliance. And a little introduction, my name is Jacopo. I work as an embedded camera engineer for Ideas On Board. Ideas On Board is a software consulting company which is specialized in camera and multimedia support for Linux systems. Um, most of my contribution are in video for Linux uh, and lib camera since the very beginning of the project. Let's start by saying what we're not going to talk about today, because software compliance could be tied to different things like license compliance, when you have to interoperate software with different or different licenses which might not be uh, compliant one with, with, with the other. Uh, software could be compliant to low, GDPR is a good example of that. Uh, could be compliant to a development process as well, if you have a well-defined development process. And could be also compliant to some standard, which usually come with um, some conformance suite, which allows you to put a stamp on your product, and you're very happy about that. We're going to talk instead about API compliance. And API, it could be defined, could be considered a sort of a standard, actually. Um, API define, an API defines a specification that has to be an interface that should be implemented by two software components in order to operate one with, its, with the other. Could be expressed in different forms, like a documentation format, formal language description, you mentioned that. And could be validated in many different ways. You can have static code analysis, like simply people reading your code, or you, we have tools like linters that could validate the API compliance of your implementation. And I'm sure there are tools which I'm not aware about that could do that with some AI power stuff. Uh, the most common form of validation is runtime validation. Unit testing is usually could be also considered formal compliance testing to make sure that you are not regressing your API implementation. Fuzzing, which means injecting uh, error condition basically or unexpected parameters in your API and see how that reacts. It's also a form of uh, compliance as well as correctness checks. I was mm, thinking about Vigrind, which uh, test the correctness in terms of memory allocation and deallocation. As we're talking about camera sensor driver and compliance, everybody who has been developing video for Linux drivers know or should know V4R2 compliance. V4R2 compliance is a great tool. It's part of the video for Linux 2 util suite, which comes with many other in, uh, very useful tools like V4R2 control, VCTL, media CTL. And it tests, it helps you test while developing that your driver supports the operation that it claims to support according to the capability that it exposes and also test and fast the implementation in order to check that corner cases are well handled and your driver is not faulty. V4R2 is a great tool. It helps a lot during development. Everybody that which is developing video for Linux drivers should be using that. But is API compliance enough? to guarantee interoperability between different implementation of the same API. Uh, if you have been following camera development in the last four or five years, you might have heard of LibCamera. Uh, LibCamera is a, a user space camera stack, which aims to abstract away the, uh, implement the complexity of the video for Linux interfaces and offers a unified API to application and frameworks to, in to interoperate with cameras. Uh, the reason being that camera got complex a long time ago. Uh, you, I'm sure you have seen these slides already. This is it's from 2009, and that's the inter user space interface of the OMAP 3 camera drivers. It's very complicated, and applications which were used to work with a simple pipeline and used to be uh, portable among different platforms now are left to suffer and are meant to be ported to platform A, B, and C to work. Uh, to work. LibCamera fills that gap. Uh, LibCamera offers a unified uh, interface to frameworks and application and abstracts away the, the platform details so your application is finally portable. That's great, it works. But what happens if you have a single platform but you want to use different camera modules? That's a typical case for embedded development board. The most famous case is Raspberry Pi, which has a set of different sensors, but many embedded board offers the same uh, set of selectable camera modules, so you have an interface and you can swap in different, different modules. And of course, modules have drivers which might differ one from each other. Uh, 
so we are now having a single consumer for different implementation of, of uh, sensor driver. And what could possibly go wrong with that? Well, a lot of things, actually. Uh, this is a little note, the focus when I, the sensor driver I'm talking about are mostly row sensor, bio for, uh, row sensor for modules, because that's the main target of lib camera, and that's the most, uh, that's the sensor which are most commonly used with platform with an ISP. And the aim of the presentation is a little bit to share the pain that we have experienced by interoperating with different camera modules in the last years, but also to provide to sensor driver developers and also reviewers uh, a list of tips or things to watch out when submitting or reviewing code which is meant to be interoper interoperable with, be, between different implementations. I have selected a basic set of feature, basic in terms that it's what LibCamera expects drivers to, to, to offer, but it's also feature that are expected by most modern applications. And for each one of those, I would like to show how modules got thing, drivers got things a little different one between the other. So let's start with the exposure and gain. That's a concept we're very, we're very well used to. It comes from the uh, usual DLSR camera. It's uh, a, a parameter that we're used to operate. And exposure, it's usually expressed as a duration. It's the time that your sensor is exposed to light and it's usually expressed as a time duration, microsecond or nanoseconds. Uh, gain instead, and might be digital or analog gain, is expressed as a scalar value. It's a multiplier which is applied to all the color channels and is expressed as a scalar value. Um, it, both value could be computed by some kind of algorithm, the AGC algorithm, when the camera is operating in auto mode, or it could come from the application or the user when the camera is operating in manual mode. If you look at exposure, that seems very simple. We got a single control in video for Linux to control that, and it might typically be, it's typically ex expressed as a number of lines that might that uh, should be exposed to light. But it turns out that the V4L2 specification do not really specify a unit for the control. So you have some driver that use lines, but some driver use fraction of lines to express the same concept, and they're all technically compliant to the specification. So it's impossible to operate them generically if they got the specifications slightly differently, one among the other. When it comes to analog gain, it's even worse. We got three control for gains. We got digital, analog, and a generic gain for sensors that are not able to discriminate between analog and digital part. And the control of the units is device specifically. It's device specific. It's usually the actual register value that it's meant to be written to the, red, to, the, to the sensor to control the gain. And it's usually very poorly documented, so it requires a lot of experimentation to get, to get it right. So this is a simplified view of the solution that we had to implement a lib camera to deal with that. Well, here it's what I've just described. You have an application that might be supplying exposure and download value in manual mode, or you have an AGC algorithm that, that, that computes those two values in auto mode. But in both cases, they are expressed as microsecond and as a scalar value, and you have to apply them to different sensors. So we had to come up with a set of helpers that basically translate uh, the analog gain value to the specific register value for each sensor. While for exposure, we decide to go for the simple way and simply decide that we're going to compute that in lines. So the takeaway from this as a tip from drivers implementer is that if you want to control exposure or, allow, or expose feature from your driver that allows you to, to control exposure, please use lines as a unit. It's very unlikely that you need to control subline duration for exposure. There might be cases for that, but in most cases, that's not the case. When it comes to gain, um, please use analog gain whenever possible. Poke at your, da uh, at your data sheet, try to find out the differences between analog and, and gain. Try to not use CID gain for row sensors because that confuses digital and analog gain. And whenever possible, provide an implementation of LibCamera for that in order that your driver could be operated generically. And we got a, a, a source of knowledge that translate to your driver specific, to your module specific, register value, a generic value. 
Another interesting feature is the traditional HV flip. Uh, they allow you to do very simple 2D plane transformation like mirroring, flipping, 180 degree rotation. That seems all very simple, right? They're very simple control, but they have subtle implication when it comes from row sensors, when it comes to row sensors. In fact, they could change the image format without user space actually wanting to change the image format. If we look at the, uh, th that's a simplified example of a, a row sensor pixel array. Uh, this is the first pixel. S sensor are usually mounted upside down to compensate for the lens, lens inversion effect. And this is the default reading rotation. So we're reading rows, then lines. And we have a bio pattern, which is the uh, expression of the pattern of the, fil the color filter, which is placed on the pixel array. And if we go and read, we have a green pattern, a red pattern, then a blue pattern, and then a green pattern. And that gives this uh, bio pattern code. But if we apply a flip, in example, the horizontal flip, we're going to read pixel in, uh, samples in a different direction. So we're going to eat a red pattern, then a green pattern, then a green pattern, and then a blue pattern. And that changes the bio pattern of the, uh, the bio pattern produced by the sensor. Same for V flip, the same for H V flip. So it happens that if you allow flipping to happen while you're streaming, you're basically changing the format of your image without actually applying a set format. That's something that video for Linux as a way to notify to use a space for there is a flag which exactly tells you that changing this control changes the, the content of the buffer or the memory layout. It's there, it's meant to be used for uh, this kind of situation, but only six driver in mainline supports that. Now, I haven't checked exactly how many drivers are row sensor buyer for buyer drivers and support flips, but I suspect there are more than six in mainline. So it might happen that some sensor allows you to flip while you're streaming and you're without notifying user space that the core pattern could change. Another interesting thing is rotation. Uh, we have been dealing with that like we have upstream a very lengthy description of uh, the device tree property like two years ago and it was meant not to be that controversial actually. Uh, we define a property which is a device tree property. It allows you if you are a device integrator it allows you to specify how your camera is rotated in your device and we have provided helpers for drivers to parse the device tree and register the value from the device tree through a read-only control. That seems very non-controversial, right? Well, it turns out, well, we already know that, that most drivers are programmed through register sequences. It means that the vendors provide you a set of register blobs and you simply apply them to, you, you write them to the bus and apply that configuration to the sensors. Well, most of those sequences embed HV flips enabled inside. That's because the vendor assumed that your camera is going to be rotated upside down for the lens uh, inversion effect that we've mentioned before. So it turns out that some driver have noticed that and got creative in order to work that around. In fact, that's, that's been removed, I think, in the last really release. It was, that's from 6.3, I guess. But some driver refused to even probe if they were not rotated 100 degree upside down because they have HV flip enabled and they say, I cannot operate if I'm not rotating the way that the configuration tell me, tells me I'm rotated. Also CCS, which is one of the most featureful drivers we, we have in mainline at the moment, had some creative way to dealing with that. Basically, try to compensate for an implicit V flip and H flip that is applied by the, by the rotation and inverse them. So if your camera is rotated and you apply a flip, basically it is inverted. And that seems very confusing. And more than that, if any driver has to have a different implementation now to deal with this kind of things, that means that it's very hard to operate them generically. So none of them was technically wrong. Uh, they complied with the API, but they were not predictable. So that was good because we had to sit down a bit and have a discussion about how to deal with those kind of things. We were meant to write documentation as well for that, but 
as a tip for implementers, um, always resist rotation with the, uh, with the value that comes from the DT properties. There is a helper for that. Do not mangle that. Do not try to compensate for that. If your driver programming, uh, programming sequences have HV flip enabled by default, please register the flip controls enabled by default. It's rather easy to find that out. Uh, you have a register blob. If you have a data sheet, you can look how the, the, the register are programmed by default. And if they are enabled, please register the control with the full value of one. And do not auto-compensate for rotation, uh, because that user space knows better in that case. They know what is the use case, they know what the application wants to do, and if the driver does things like you try to outsmart user space, it might get very confusing. Uh, there is another thing which we have been dealt with in the past, which is the selection targets. We want to know the geometry of the sensors, and we have, are kindly requesting driver, but I hope Leap Camera will make that mandatory in the future, to support a few selection targets. Uh, some of them are trivial. We want to know the full pixel array size. That's a property which is useful to expose to applications sometimes. We want to know what are the bounds of the pixel array. So all the, pixel, all the readable pixel array area, which includes the valid and not valid pixels, like optically dark pixels, or uh, which are used for, for black level corrections, or pixels which are shielded. We want to know if that's possible to read them. We want to know what is the default analog crop, because that is the implication of the field of view of your images. And more interestingly, we want to know the crop rectangle, what we, it's called usually the analog crop rectangle. Uh, three targets are static. They do not change during the driver operation. So in one case, we have to report the full pixel array size. This is the, it's slightly more colored. It's, it's the crop default, the crop bound, I'm sorry, and that's the crop default, which specifies the full field of view of your sensors. But the crop rectangle, the analog crop rectangle, has implication on two things which are uh, sensible for sensor drivers. The first one is the image field of view. The more you restrict the crop rectangle, the more less information you lose, right? And it also impacts the sensor frame rate because the larger is the portion of the pixel array that you feed to your internal processing pipeline, the larger is the timing that you require to be processed, so the lower is the frame rate. So it's very important to know in the current configuration what is your analog crop rectangle. Uh, just as an example, this is two images with the same exact output out resolution. This is 180p, I, if I recall correctly, but in one case, it's, that's the full field of view, so the analog crop rectangle was maximized. In the other case, it was re reduced, so you lose a lot of information around that. And probably this mode is faster than the other one. So TGT crop, please implement that. So far, we require them just to be readable, but as we want to go in a direction where we can control fully the configuration of the sensor, we would like to make them zoom to be writable as well. And also to allow change in the, the field of view of the image that you, are, uh, that you are producing. Another interesting thing are blankings. So we got lengthy discussion in the past on how to control the frame rate of the sensor. VDF Linux provide an API, which is the set get frame interval operation, which is kind of a misleading API. It gives you a false sense of simplicity, but it hides a lot of details. We all know that the frame duration is, uh, it's, that's a very simple formula. You got the total number of pixels that you put on the bus, in visible and blankings, which are the not active ones and you have the pixel rate. That gives you the frame duration, which of course gives you, gives you the frame rate, but it depends on a lot of, a lot of different parameter, pixel rate and blankings. If we provide an API like set and get frame interval, we are losing a lot of things in the middle, and sensor might be operated differently, might be operated different pixel rate, but with the same blankings, or you might want to enlarge the blankings and maintain the same pixel rate. That's something that is, should be controllable from user space. Drivers should not try to outsmart user space in that regard. So the total frame size depends on blanking as well. But what happens when you apply, when you apply, depends on blanking and visible pixels, but what happens when you apply a new format? So you change the visible, um, the visible 
sizes of the frame that you are producing? Well, some driver reset blankings to default. So that means that you apply a format and that changes the frame rate of, the, of your stream. Some driver adjusted the blanking only if they exceed the limit. So you apply a new format and you maintain the frame duration. Again, none of this is really specified in the API. Seems like an implementation detail, but you have, if you're building something on, on top of those things and you make assumption, you might be displeased. And another interesting thing about blankings, you might have seen this pattern in many, many sensor drivers. So we know that the maximum exposure time is limited by the total size of the frame that you are producing. So if you change the blankings, it means that you might have to change the exposure time as well. This is a pattern that all drivers implement, with all drivers that support controllable blankings at least. And that's something that should probably be better handled some, somewhere in the core instead of having drivers do the same pattern every time. But so vBlank limits exposure. And if you need to set both of them, you have to be very careful because you need to set vBlank first, let the driver update the exposure limit, and then set the exposure again. And you have to be careful about the order of the operation because if you do things in the wrong order, you might have surprising results. As a result of that, uh, not long time ago, Benjamin tried to um, overcome this, introducing a new control, which is currently in discussion. Uh, that's something that it was meant to happen a lot, long time ago. And, and if I got the uh, recollection right, that's something that we start in lib camera as a, uh, as a discussion, and then as we move to the kernel, which to me is a great thing because it means that cross-pollination between user space framework and the driver that are meant to be used by that framework produces better implementation in kernel space. Uh, there are other interesting things and then my, uh, where the API might actually fall short. So we know that this is, if this is the output frame resolution and this is the analog crop on the pixel array, we know that the same output resolution could be obtained in different ways. Could be obtained by binning, by subsampling or skipping frame. It might be obtained by cropping but we don't have an API currently to express that. So driver, of course, had to be creative. And some of them actually uh, kind of abuse the selection targets to compute the uh, scaling factor. Some other uses the, the TGT crop target and the output size to compute the scaling factor. Again, none of those is actually wrong according to the API but there is no way you can control it in a, in, a, in a reliable way from user space. So the takeaway from all of this, it's actually that writing application that works generically with multiple sensor drivers, it's very hard. It's probably as hard as implementing, not as hard as porting between different platform or SOCs, but you need something that abstracts away of that complexity because otherwise you, we will be implementing the same thing in your application every time. And when the API doesn't help them, for many reasons, because the API, API, API could be underspecified, sometimes for good reasons, API cannot get all the implementation detail right, the drivers might get creative. And the only way to overcome them is to be careful during review or do, while you are implementing them. Uh, Something that I think is very important is that having a standard consumers of the kernel API, it's a guarantee that uh, different implementations are more consistent one among the other. Uh, API compliance, even if we have tool to do so, it might, it's not enough to guarantee interoperability. So as I've said, it requires a lot of review effort to get things consistent among different implementation. And if we have a reference implementation that define the expectation, it's easier for even for driver implementers to get things, I'm not saying right, but more consi consistently among one among the other. Uh, another thing which I think is relevant is that for a long time, kernel API, not just in media, have been implemented, but not exercised consist consistently. When you introduce a new API, you, you are meant to provide a test for that in some test uh, utility. But the way that is actually exercised by application is very dependent on the application that, that, that uses the, the implementation. Uh, 
Again, having a reference consumer of the implementation guarantees that the, divide, the, design, chain, the design choices made by kernel space are actually sensible for user space as well. Uh, going forward, uh, like it happens for DRM and KMS. If you want to introduce a new API, you have to provide an, an implementation in some reference framework like Wayland or, or EGT or other test suites. We don't have nothing like that yet formalized for media, but going forward, having a standard consumers when uh, driver developers that want to introduce a new API are meant to provide an implementation for, I think is a guarantee that the design choices made in kernel space are actually sensible for application as well. That will be it for me. I know I'm being probably too fast, but if there are questions, otherwise we're gonna have an early lunch. Any question, Hans? Nope. I can repeat the question if you want. <laughs> That's why you're still in business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to fix microphones? <laughs> okay. Pixel tool compliance is actually used for new varieties and they should comply with no pixel API with the latest and greatest uh, proper practices. So you can be all for free in the future. And that is not allowed. So it will be central. I think that will Okay. Oh, well, it makes perfect sense. Uh, I understand that there is a lot of legacy there. And oh, sorry, yes. Uh, Hans' remark was that v 4 2 compliance doesn't just do API testing. As I partially said, that it also does fussing and testing the implementation for correctness. And most of the things that uh, we have mentioned in this presentation could actually be implemented as test as part of v 4 2 compliance. Is that correct, Hans? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. And I understand that there is a lot of legacy in v 4 2 compliance and the landscape of devices that it, it was meant to deal with has changed during the year. So yeah, there might be space there indeed. And v 4 2 compliance is a wonderful tool and everybody should be using that if they are upstreaming code to video for Linux. Is the Eugene? <laughs> if the compliance tool requires specific behavior, right, shouldn't that be set in stone in the API, the documentation? to the latest testing. Hey, <laughs> wow. Okay, let's try that again. So um, the question was, oh, you repeated that already, so don't need to do that. Uh, FIFRO 2 compliance is for new drivers, like new sensors, and you want to make sure that they comply to the best practices. And you can't, sometimes you can put it back into documentation, but quite often there are already older drivers that do it like that and well then it's part of the public api but what you really want for new drivers you should follow all these problems that you have discovered 
And whether the compliance test would warn or fail on that, that is something you can discuss, but it should certainly output a message for if it doesn't comply. Um, since I have the mic anyway, I can have a follow-up question. Sure. <laughs> Do we have a gold standard sensor driver that people can use as a reference if they make a new one? Yeah. Yes and no. Uh, so the most featureful one, it's indeed CCS. And this, the, the one that got the most attention, I guess, has been developed by one of the maintainers of the, of the subsystem. So it has a lot of features, but it's also very complex. Uh, the golden standard for lib camera use cases are usually the sensor which are used by Raspberry Pi because they made a, uh, a lot, they put a lot of effort in the implementation, both in the sensor driver in terms of features and both in lib camera. So I would mention the IMX219, an example, IMX290 probably, 296, 477 as well. Uh, it's a review, you're right. Uh, so yeah, there are sensor that uh, I would mention the Raspberry Pi camera modules in that regard. Eugene had the question as well, or? Yeah, but okay. Oh, I, I don't want to force you. <laughs> So you discovered all these kind of issues with all the controls, but have you come back to well, let's enhance the documentation on them on the website that there is for media to add some kind of use case. For example, when I read those a while ago, I don't know if you already added something to them or not. Analog gain was just, this is the analog gain. Yeah. So maybe we could enhance that with such use cases such that people will get used to it or obsolete some of them at totally some point correct. because yeah. an example uh, I'm, I'm, the blame is also on us because I mean I, I'm pointing those things out and one like you said why, why not correct the specification in that case uh, because sometimes you know for analog gain uh, that really depends on the sensor implementation the exposure example I made for some drivers fine to expose them in subline units I uh, don't see a really need for that, but maybe the driver implementer had, had a use case for that. Uh, when it comes to rotation, we had like, like I th th three meetings where, uh, to discuss that, and we were supposed to update the documentation with that, but we didn't actually got there. So you're right, all those things should become more, should be formalized in documentation correction in v 2 compliance tests. And that's something, yeah, I take the blame a little bit for that, for not doing that already. So, yeah. That might help with getting reviews done easily because people Correct. start the driver, they send a patch, and after some time, someone like you or someone else who knows all this comes and say, okay, you're doing all wrong, yeah. so you have to rework everything. And that becomes, if it's not documented, like you say, it becomes tribal knowledge, right? I know yes. that because somebody told me that, that somebody told that, and I, I know, I understand. That's totally correct. Okay, thank you. Hans again? <laughs> Sorry, something just popped in my head. Um, talking about the exposure control where there's no unit defined, but you would like to use lines, I think it's perfectly fine to put it in a documentation that uh, it's strongly preferred to use lines as the units for your control unless it's absolutely not possible. Something along those lines, which should I don't think there's any problem putting it in there. And then it's at least in the specification. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, about exposure control and lines, um, and in general the compliance, is it a different way for global shutter cameras to handle all that, and is this a different way of compliance for global shutter cameras? Hmm. I don't think it's that different when it comes to exposure, but of course they are, there are differences. Uh, I can not, I don't have any thing that comes from top of my mind, but I'm sure there are differences and that should be specified in the API documentation indeed. I don't know if anybody has some ideas about that or 
Uh, one, uh, one of the things that we don't support in video filmings today when it comes to exposure time is to be able to specify both both a coarse exposure time and fine exposure time. And most sensors support that, regardless of whether they're in global shutter or rolling shutter, actually, um, because we've simply had no need for that so far, at least in people coming to uh, coming to us upstreaming drivers and using those drivers. That's something we should do. Uh, and so just the number of lines is fine for most use cases but it's not going to cover everything. So I'd like to extend that to at least being able to control the fan exposure and possibly uh, there are sensors that express the exposure time in different units as well. Do we want to convert everything to lines in the kernel to have a uniform API to user space or offer other options? That's up in the at the moment. So you have, if you have good ideas on how to unify that, uh, patches would be welcome. Uh, at least at least proposals and, and ideas so we could discuss them because that's one of the things we're missing as well is feedback from the industry on use cases that we wouldn't know about or shortcomings that we wouldn't know about and that's very valuable for us yeah and that's sensible for hdr which is something which is not very well exercised at the moment as far as i can tell in video for linux so industry use cases are very valuable for that to validate the, the decisions any other question Thank you then. Enjoy your lunch and thank you for being here.